Welcome back into the Original Gangsters podcast. I'm your host, Scott Bernstein, along with my co-conspirator and partner in crime, the Dr. Jimmy Bucciolato. Hi, everyone. uh, This week, we're going to do what we kind of love to do here uh, at the OG. We're going to mix it up. We're going to go current breaking headlines, and then we're going to go backwards and, and give some context and talk about a very iconic film and iconic uh uh, crime. We're going to talk about Vinny Asaro, the longtime Bonanno crime family skipper from Queens, uh, who passed away this this last week. He was 88 years old, died of a heart attack. Uh, his kind of claim to fame in terms of, you know, outside of his borough uh, is that he was an alleged participant in the Lufanza. Airlines terminal heist that was depicted in the movie Goodfellas. Um, at the time, it was the the highest um, grossing robbery, armed robbery in American history. Six million dollars in cash and valuables, December eleventh, nineteen seventy eight. And then, in the coming months, you had uh, the cleanup um, of of that crime and the the cutting of all ties and and uh, uh loose ends being taken care of by the guy that masterminded it jimmy the gent burke played by robert de niro in the movie and asaro was very close with jimmy burke and they were together the whole uh, according to court testimony and, and fbi files uh were together the night of the robbery um only one person has ever been convicted in that robbery Uh, one of the reasons is a lot of the people that pulled it are dead they were murdered in a hit parade orchestrated by jimmy burke and aided by vinny asaro allegedly um and then asaro was brought up on charges related to the lufanza heist in the last decade uh 2014 but ended up beating the case at trial in 2015 his first cousin and former right-hand man Gaspari Valente was the star witness. He was one of the uh, perpetrators. So let's just kind of start off. Uh, I'm going to throw it over to Jimmy, and we're going to do just kind of a quick bio of Vinny Asaro. Um, and, and let's just say before we start, you know, the Asaro crew in Queens is still allegedly active. Um, so this is kind of a, 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 a legacy that will live on well past uh, Vinny's passing. Yeah, I mean, we want to talk about the Lutanza stuff and, and some of the current stuff, but just to start off, I think it's a good place to think about this legacy. And um, by the way, I'm not I'm not feeling well, so if, um, I'll do my best to, <laughs> to get through this, but my voice is kind of scratchy. But the um, Asaro clan is, some, is, is a group that I'm very interested in as a case study because they trace their origins to Castellamare, which... Um, is, is my primary case study that I researched. That's where my family is from, and there's actually a connection. And uh, the way I've heard it pronounced in, in Sicilia is Asaro, but, you know, here we say Asaro. Um, but but Vinny Asaro, who we're talking about now, his son, whose name is Jerry, who's an active member of the Bonanno family, is fifth-generation mafiosi. So the, the Asaro clan has very deep roots, both in Sicily and New York. And, and as a matter of fact, I've even uncovered some things from like the mid 1800s that, that this clan was pretty prominent in, in the evolution of the mafia in, in Castellamare. And probably the biggest name that comes out of this documentation is Girolamo, um, Girolamo Asaro, who is, this gets confusing, but that, that's Vinny's great grandfather. And uh, his son was Vincenzo, his son was Jerry, his son was Vinny, the one we're talking about, and then his son. So, you know, the Sicilian tradition, everyone has the, the same names. But uh, Gerolamo, I have some court documentation on him that going back to the 1800s, that he and my great-great-grandfather, Salvatore Bucciolato, 
were jammed up on the same murder case. And uh, it's pretty interesting because I can see when they when they raided my great grandfather, great great grandfather's uh, farm and when they arrested him. I think it was around 11 o'clock at night. And uh, they murdered a guy that they suspected was uh, uh, an informant. Even back in the late 1800s, they were worried about that. And uh, Girolamo eventually migrates to the United States, which like a lot of my relatives did too. That's why I'm here. And so that legacy continued being involved in the Castellamare's mafia, um, not only in Sicily, but in New York. And it, it, it goes down goes down the line. And um, Vinny's father was a mafioso connected to Joe Bonanno. Um, if you look at those court documents, Joe Bonanno's baptismal godfather, one of my relatives, distant relatives, Feligi Bucciolato, he's in those court documents. It's, it's pretty, pretty good stuff. Um, but anyhow, so he has these deep connections to Sicily and New York. Um, Vinny's uncle, Joseph Asaro, was a member of the Montreal Decina. And later on, when we get into some of the stuff in the 70s and 80s, we'll, we'll revisit some of this in terms of connections to Sicily and the Zips. But um, I think it's pretty compelling. I find these case studies, it's just my thing. Um, I think these case studies are fascinating where it's like Godfather shit. Yeah. Where, like it's multiple generations of, of people um, in, in one specific family who have a tradition. Like and Vinny Asaro, who we're talking about here, you know, we're talking a half century of him being a major player um, in the American mafia. So you know, you're going all the way back to the golden era of American La Cosa Nostra when all the stuff you saw in movies was, was going on and these guys were rubbing elbows with celebrities and um, didn't have as much attention from the FBI, at least early in Vinny's career. Uh, but, you know, you mentioned his, his family. It, it should be noted that his uh, one of his uncles was also uh, was Mickey Zaffirano, Michael Zaffirano, they called Mickey Z, who was the Bonanno's pornography king. Um, and it was based kind of in between New York and Los Angeles, uh, owned the Pussycat Theater in Times Square. And uh, so, you know, this is a guy that, you know, he, he can trace his roots uh, over to the other side. And he obviously had uh, a rich bloodline that he leveraged forward. Uh, we know that he was inducted in a, in a summer 1977 ceremony. Jimmy's got some uh, kind of in-depth, unknown tidbits from from that making ceremony that we want to share with you. Yeah, and I, I just want to give a shout out to the uh, mob archaeologists. They they helped me with with um, a lot of this information. But um, according to Valenti's testimony, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, Vinny was made by Carmine, Carmine Galante in the mausoleum uh, of a cemetery. And um, I think that's pretty interesting. And uh, it's sort of macabre. And I'm not sure why. Maybe um, it's, a, it's an ideal location to avoid scrutiny, I, I, I suspect, is one reason. But someone, um, an off-the-record source of mine, mentioned to me that if you know Vinny, it's very apropos <laughs> he was made in uh, in a mausoleum because he was a pretty serious, pretty serious dude. Yeah. And again, I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves here, but it will be, as the show goes on and, and we're going to get into the real story of the Lufanza heist and the, Martin's as, as much as over the podcast, we've uh, eviscerated Scorsese for, for taking so many, uh, so much dramatic license in the Irishman. Uh, with with Goodfellas and with Casino, he st he's stuck pretty close to the facts. And what you saw on the screen was pretty similar to what happened in real life. And Asaro, according to uh, his cousin's testimony and some other informants, the famous scene in Goodfellas where they find Frankie Carbone frozen in the meat locker, uh, that was a, a Vinny Asaro special there. Uh, allegedly... Jimmy Burke, Jimmy DeGent murdered uh, a guy named Richie Eaton, who the Frankie Carbone character was a composite of a couple different guys, Richie Eaton being one of them, and uh, lured him to a 
a, a warehouse in Queens, uh, tortured and murdered him, and then handed the body over to Vinny Asaro and Gaspar Valente, according to Valente's testimony. And they are the ones that disposed of him in a portable uh, refrigeration vehicle, meat locker, and hung him on a hook. And just like the, the Ray Liotta character with the voiceover, they had the the coroner's office had to wait 48 hours for the body to um, defrost before they could do the autopsy. Yeah, I mean, he was a pretty serious guy. And, and you know, to be fair, <clears throat> I think there's a lot of intel we can gather from Valenti's testimony. To, to be fair, he was deemed in a lot of ways to have a lot of flaws as, as a character witness because uh, so so that's why Vinny was acquitted on a lot of this stuff, including say, murder say, charges. Did we say that? I'm sorry if we if we buried that heat. No, you what? did. Yeah, you said he was acquitted. Yeah, and oh, so, yeah, he beat yeah. the he beat the case. Yeah, uh, in 2015. However, a couple years after that, he gets uh, nailed in an in a arson uh, revenge case where some guy cut him off in traffic. <laughs> right, that was later. On. Yeah. He ordered one of his underlings to go torch this guy's car. Uh, so in eighty uh to this was 2017 so he would have been 82 an 82 year old uh vinny Asaro had to go back to federal prison he had a, a pretty stiff sentence that he got um reduced during covid so he was in for about three years and has spent the last three years uh, a free man but has been retired his his son allegedly runs that queen's crew for banano uh, for the bananos it should be also um mentioned that him and his son had a, a very uh, rocky relationship um very hot and cold so i'm not exactly sure where they ended I, I know not that long ago they weren't on speaking terms so that's what even, i've that's what i've heard too even though jerry asaro is allegedly the the capo uh of of the of the banano uh, queen that queen's faction that uh his father was in charge of as far back as the 70s, the FBI uh, references uh, a promotion for Vinny Asaro in 1979. Uh, he got he got uh, bumped up to Capo. So and that was, was the fast Capo track for a long time. Yeah. And that was the fast track because he wasn't a soldier for very long. Before, right. Two years. Before he was before he was um, uh, bumped up. Um, and, he, and he was like the consummate mob politician. Uh, in the sense that he was connected to a lot of different families, a lot of different people, uh, both Sicilian, uh, American born, Irish. Uh, he was very close to Jimmy Burke, who was a Lucchese guy, uh, the equivalent of a, of a May guy or a Capo, but because he was Irish, could not uh, get made. Very close to the to John Gotti and those, uh, yeah, uh, the, the Queen's Gambinos. Yeah, the yeah I was going to say I've heard that he was he was pretty friendly with Gotti, especially like back in the day, and and so that kind of brings us into how he got uh, involved in the Lufanza heist was that um, in the seventies and eighties, uh, Vinny's regime uh, and Vinny w were in charge of the uh, Bonanno Airport rackets in at JFK Airport in Queens. And uh, anything, any illegal activity that was going on at the airport, uh, I think all five families had representatives that were in charge of airport affairs. So even though the Lucchese's uh, mapped out and carried out the Lufanza heist, they had to cut other families into the conspiracy and, and a, a piece of the pie of the profits. Uh, at least we know the the bananos and the gambinos were uh, were were br were brought in by the Lucchese's on the uh, on the on the heist. Yeah, do we know why? Before we get into the the details of it, do we? Because Henry Hill talks about and Pelleggi talk about a sorrow in Wise Guy. Do we know why Scorsese didn't include? Was it a legal just, thing or no? I think it was just he didn't want to get. Uh, I don't. I think he didn't want to confuse the viewers uh, with bringing in too many different people. And, and I mean, you already had to introduce a lot of characters okay. for the for the heist because most of those characters you don't meet, except for Frenchie. I don't think you meet any of those characters until they introduce him in that scene at the uh, at the bar 
where they said, this yeah. is the guys or these are the guys that Jimmy put together to pull right. off the biggest robbery in American history. Yeah. And he kind of introduces them. Yeah. Uh, so I think he probably wanted to cut down on how many people he wanted to introduce and and not confuse the audience. That's just my amateur yeah, if you're I bringing mean, it, so he, he, he talked about all the guys that were in the Lucchese crew that that were involved in it, and we'll go over those guys in a second. I don't think he wanted to start bringing in other crime families. Uh, yeah, it gets it gets more challenging to manage because you're going to get into the details. But my understanding is that Vinny is it was an integral part of this conspiracy. Like he, he, was, he was a major player in this. Heist. Yeah, well, he he spent the entire. Uh, evening or early morning hours of, of December 11th, which is when the heist was pulled off 1978. He was with, according to the testimony informants, FBI records, he was with Jimmy Burke the entire time before, yeah. during, and after. Yeah. Uh, and walked away with uh, $1.5 million uh, of the $6 million score. Yeah. And I don't, you know, again, this is like off the record, but, um, I heard that. <clears throat> excuse me. He went through a lot of that money, just like they oh, show they, in the movie. Asar, Asar, well, I know Asaro himself went through a lot of that money <laughs> right. really quick. Gamble, right. gamble a I've lot heard. of it away. Right. That's yeah. what I've heard. Yeah. Yeah. It didn't take him long. But uh, just to give you know people um, to to do the kind of uh, tale of the tape when you're talking about the movie Goodfellas and what really happened. Uh, you you see in the film. The uh, the wig guy, Maury, the wig guy, uh, present Henry Hill this opportunity to, to rip off uh, the Lufanza terminal. Uh, Henry Hill and that crew had years earlier uh, using a couple of the guys that they would use in Lufanza, uh, ripped off Air France. Yeah. And uh, came away uh, with a nice chunk of change that kind of uh solidified Henry Hill uh, and Tommy D Simone as as uh players and Tommy D in the movies Tommy DeVito in real life his name was Tommy D Simone and as Joe Pesci won an Oscar for playing the character and there was a lot of similarities but there was also some at least physically there were some differences uh the Tommy DeVito obviously Joe Pesci's a tiny guy uh Tommy D Simone who they called two gun Tommy was a strapping like a six foot like an athletic looking like six foot two broad shoulders <clears throat> um but had the same kind of hair trigger temper um known as a cowboy was a real cowboy and and just like you saw with uh in the film uh with the billy bat scene it was more than just billy bats tommy d simone had murdered two uh pretty influential figures in the Gambino crew uh, or sorry, in the Gambino family, part of the Gotti crew. Um, and that would be, but Billy bats and uh, another guy by the name of Foxy Jerothy, um, who were both close friends of the Gotti's. So. And, wh and what was that about the, what was the, the Foxy one? What was, it was over, a, it was over a woman. Oh, so it was another like impulsive, and then thing. Billy, and then the and just to do the compare and contrast. Billy Bats told Tommy to go get a shine box. That really happened. Uh, it was when Bats was was uh, whose real name was William Bentavina. Uh, he had just come home from prison, but the timeline was was changed. They didn't yeah. murder him that night. They murdered him like two weeks later. Where they lured they lured Billy Bats back to um, the suite, which was the name of the the restaurant. Yeah, I, I don't want to um, get too far, stray too far from the chronology here. But if those of the audience that follow us on Instagram, I just reposted something. It was from another account. The scene where um, he shoots stacks. And you hear the two gunshots, and then but you, you, he's out of he's out of the camera, and you just hear uh, Pesci go, "What the fuck are you looking at?" <laughs> make that make that coffee to go. Make that coffee to go. <laughs> right, and then he starts walking out with a pot of coffee. He's like, yeah. "What the fuck are you doing?" Was <laughs> I'm joking with you. I'm sorry that that scene still is funny to me. After how many times have we seen that movie? A thousand between the two of us. Yeah, and that scene still cracks me up. <laughs> but you know, it, just just keep on uh, on the same angle. 
you know, if you study the, the real story of Lufanza and the real story behind those characters, Parnell Stax Edwards, who was played by Samuel L. Jackson in the movie, was more than he was kind of presented in the film. In the film, it was kind of, oh, Stax was a guy that hung around the bar and played the guitar and was into, you know, credit card scams or whatever. But Stax was somebody that was very deeply embedded in that Robert, it was called the Robert's Robert's Lounge Crew, which was the name of, of Jimmy the Gent's bar. Um, he was more than just kind of a hangaround. He was very close friends with Tommy D. Mm. Um, and even though Tommy D ended up killing him, I believe, at least in the movie he does, uh, and, and doesn't seem to give a shit about it. <clears throat> um, I know in reality that Tommy Tommy D was very broken up mm. uh, when they had when they had to kill Stax because he was so close to him. That's interesting. Which which does it doesn't seem like it fits, you know, a a black con man, uh, and and the you know the Tommy D character that you see in the movie, but yeah. in reality, you know, they were very close friends, and and Stax Edwards was a very trusted member of that crew, which is why they decided to include him. Whether or not he should have been, I guess, is a different story. But what you saw in the movie is what happened. Instead of getting rid of the getaway car he uh parked it in a no parking zone and went to his girlfriend's house and they got ticketed and 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 wiped for fingerprints uh, and that's why uh Stax was the first uh murder in in these kind of aftermath killings 12 mur 12 murders um that occurred in the aftermath of Lufanza because Jimmy Burke did not want to a share the money or b have any connections that could be made between him and the actual guys that that stole the money and Vinny Asaro according to the FBI uh helped him not just steal the money but also launder the money and then hide some of the money and then helped him if he if he, if he wasn't actually involved in the hits themselves he helped with some of the conspiracies so what was his role in the actual heist, like like the actual mechanics of the heist? Because we know he's brought in, but so then he, do we know what, what his actual involvement in the mechanics he put, was? He put Valenti with the uh, the the armed robbery team. Okay. So Valenti was on the scene. Yeah. Um, he was with Jimmy Burke. Uh, I think, I don't know if they were at Valenti's house. They were at someone's house to start um, when they all masked up and departed then he was with burke in a crash car and a car that was monitoring uh police activity on a scanner about a, a a block or two away from the airport okay uh, valenti who was his, uh asaro's first cousin right hand man now valenti's son is allegedly a soldier um, in the family that uh, disavowed his father, Fat, yeah. Sam, Fat Sammy Valenti. Yeah. Uh, but according to testimony, uh, Gaspari's role in the, you know, his job, his assignment, was when they got to the airport and they got onto the grounds and they needed access to get into the Lafonza Terminal parking lot, which gave them access to the building, that uh, Valente. Uh, with a pair of bolt cutters, uh, broke open the parking lot to let the hit team, uh, or not hit team, I'm sorry, let the uh, the robbery team, uh, you know, into the um, property that they then ended up sticking up, and uh, we uh, a lot of the names that you that you heard uh, in the movie were the guys that stuck it up, uh, Tommy D, um, the another guy that was a part of a. a the composite for Frankie Carbone. Carbone was like part Richie Eaton, and we'll get into who Richie Eaton is in a second, and then part uh, this guy named Angelo Seppi, who was mm. probably more of a Carbone. He spoke Sicilian, uh, like Carbone is always kind of yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, of making little making little quips, uh, uh, and um, so Angelo Seppi was one of the the. Um, the the, the, the the stick up men and then you had um Frenchie McMahon who was uh 
the guy that helped him with the Air France and then was involved in this as well. He worked at the airport. Uh, and then you had a guy named Joe Man Ree, who they called Joe Buddha, who was referenced in the film. Um, and then you had uh, another guy um, by the name of Louis Cafora. Uh, in the movie, they call him, I think they call him Johnny Roast Beef. Uh, in, um, in real life, he was Louis Roast Beef. I think sometimes they called him Louis the Whale. Um, and he was Jimmy Burke's former uh, prison cellmate. And uh, Valente went along, and then a, a Gambino uh, um, figure, Apollo Locastri, uh, also went along. So you had most of these guys were Lucchese's, and then you had one Bonanno and one Gambino on the actual uh, robbery team. Yeah, and just to clarify, um, Vinia Saro's mother was a Valenti, which is, by the way, another name in, in Castellamare. Now, I don't know if they were Castellamare's. Someone can fact check. I mean, not necessarily, but I, I wouldn't surprise me if they married into the Asaro family. And um, so his, his mom, um, her nephew was Gaspar Valenti. So that that's how their first Primo Cugini um and that's why I think there's other documentation that suggests that they were basically inseparable. They, they were really close. That's why I think there's some valuable intel in his testimony, even though ultimately it was determined that, I mean, he, he, he had a reputation as a degenerate gambler. And that really, I think that really hurt his kind of credibility as a witness. And by the way, that's what the, one of the theories is why he was never made because he was on record, but he was never made because, um, he was such a degenerate gambler, owed a lot of made guys money that that he, he might have been killed if it weren't for Vinny, basically smoothing. smoothing well, and that's, that and from what I understand, that's one of the reasons that he went scurrying to the feds was because he was in so much debt and Vinny couldn't yeah. help him out. Right. Right. But it, but it makes sense that he would be at that time. He would have been part of the heist because they were so close. Yeah. And uh, the heist ends up taking about 90 minutes from about three in the morning to around four thirty. Um they take hostages, basically, uh, tie a bunch of people up, uh, uh, force them to give them access. Um, they had gotten a tip. I think I started to say this earlier in the broadcast and I got sidetracked. But um, like you saw in the film, um, the tip uh, you see in the film, the tip goes from uh, Maury, the wig guy to Henry Hill to Jimmy, the gent. But there was actually more of a. Um, a longer kind of chain of custody there where there was a guy named Lou Werner who was a degenerate gambler who was a worked as a, a, a at the airport and worked at, in the Lufanza terminal and had stolen money out of, uh, from the terminal a couple of years before that. And in order to clear a $20,000 debt, which today would, you know, would be, considerably more twenty thousand dollars in 1978 is quite the uh yeah it's quite the sum he owed that money to the to maury the wig guy whose real name was marty krugman they called him marty the rug and uh it was very very similar to what the, the to the character you saw uh played by actor chuck Lowe, uh played played maury in the uh goodfellas movie but uh, lou werner traded the twenty thousand dollar debt for the tip on the money coming in and the security procedures that they would need to um, get around to, to get in there. So they had, a, they had inside men, uh, a number of inside men uh, at the terminal while the, before the robbery so that they could plan it. And then during the robbery. Yeah. And I, I know it's annoying, but it's such a good scene where, where Burke is strangling. <laughs> Well, well, no, the <laughs> fuck him in the fuck him in the ear, fuck, fuck him in the, the other ear. Yeah, he's, he's like, you got the money for the commercial. Fucking break my balls. <laughs> Give me the fucking money. <laughs> well, you think you think I what is it? You think I agreed to what? Like some percentage above the big? What are you? Oh yeah, schmuck on wheels. Schmuck on wheels. <laughs> That that movie is just perfectly cast. Been, I, 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 I'm sorry Jimmy, to keep on going back to it, but it's just perfect. Jimmy, he's been an unconscionable ball bust. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's the perfect movie. I've said this, it's the. There's nothing wrong with that movie from, no. from start to finish. Yeah, it's it's outstanding <laughs> because there are other movies that I consider all time greats that I, if you gave me like editing 
uh responsibility i would still go in there and cut a little here cut a little there like yeah. scarface uh, there'd be a, or even some of the godfathers i would trim a little here or there yeah or add some here take some here goodfellas is just unbelievably uh perfect in, in so many different ways so um a sorrow in them uh they started the this i believe it was um like again i think i believe it was uh uh valente's residence um and then uh, they they actually end up at a like an auto shop in Canarsie, uh, where they unloaded uh, a lot of the um, uh, of the, the loot that they stole, um, which was owned by a uh, Jimmy Burke. So there's know, another t- tidbit about about his relationship with Burke, and I just love I just love this. It, it reminds me of the Tony Soprano character. Another pop culture reference. Sorry to be so annoying, if, but. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if it was that garage or not, but I can't remember. I'd have to look at the documentation. But there was a guy who was abusing his dog, and he ended up killing the dog. And Asaro and Burke were going to kill him because of that. They were they were so they were like both like animal lovers, <laughs> and were so like offended. The only time you saw Tony, <laughs> Tony was more upset about that dog dying. Yeah, yeah, that, and the yeah. horse and the yeah. and the dogs. <laughs> yeah, and I couldn't help when I read that to think if if. David Chase or somebody, if, if, if they had, I don't know if they were privy to that information, if that sort of inspired them. But Burke and Nassaro were, were seriously contemplating killing this guy over, over abusing the dog. And it's just, it's just, it's just so, the, the irony is fantastic, right? Because these guys will kill other gangsters without, without well, other human beings without thinking twice, but they're, but they're uh, um, offended by animal abuse. I just think it's, it's, it's just outstanding uh, kind of anecdote. <laughs> And I forgot to say that uh, Jimmy the Gent's son, Frankie Boy, was also one of the uh, robbers. Yeah. And um, Frankie Boy was a lot of these. I think of him, and I think of uh, uh, Neil Della Croce's son. Uh, obviously, Sonny Red uh, Bruno, who, Bruno yeah. who was able to survive some of those early drug-addled years. But uh, it seems like some of these big shots have kids that uh, have a difficult time following in the footsteps. I mean, I know Fr- uh, Frankie had a, a lot of, um, you know, those are big shoes to fill in his dad, but uh, I yeah. know that he was somebody that uh, kind of allegedly abused some, some of his power or the power that he thought that he had from his dad and was a, a, a big uh, drinker and drugger. And so they, they brought him along as well. Um, it, you know, like Stax Edwards again uh, was told to get rid of the van. Uh, he was supposed to bring it to New Jersey, uh, but instead um, he went to his girlfriend's house and they find the van. Within like three days, the FBI uh, has identified the Jimmy the Gents crew as the guys that had, that had done this. Now, it's interesting that so from December 14th, 1978, to October 2023, they've known pretty much from top to bottom what happened. But other than Lou Werner, who they uh, who got who they got for being the tip the tipster for uh, letting the the uh, Jimmy the Gents crew know what was going on and, and the fact that they could rob the airport, they they've had no convictions, uh, barely any arrests. Vinny, they that was kind of gra- grasping at straws back in. 2015 when they put Vinny Asaro on trial it seemed like so it's just it's interesting to see how quickly the feds were on to what exactly happened maybe you can make you know similar uh something analogous to the Jimmy Hoffa case that we talk about a lot but just because you know it doesn't mean you can prove it and doesn't mean you're gonna actually bring people to justice and find them accountable yeah you can't you're not necessarily going to bring forth a prosecution um because of that um yeah, it's a. <clears throat> I think it's also interesting that <clears throat> because I believe I'm not an expert on the case, but shout out to the Scott was part of the Goodfellas documentary on. Uh, it was on Fox, right? The, yeah, on Fox um, Nation. It's called. Uh, I think it's called the Lufanza Heist. Yeah, and then uh, I, I highly recommend Pelleggi's book Wise Guy if you haven't read it. It's one oh, of the great. Yeah. And then our our friend Tony De Stefano has a book about the Lufanza Heist, which which has a lot of stuff about Asaro. Um, but my understanding is that Jimmy Burke was annoyed with some of the guys being so gaudy with spending yeah. their money 
But a lot of it in, in the mafia, and this is something Scott and I are, are really interested in, is the sociology of it, but also the political science of it is that depends on your stature and your juice, right? You could get away with certain things like Vinny Asaro if you're a made guy. Well, I think the fact that Asaro wasn't held as accountable as some other people that were um, acting reckless uh, was the fact that he was so juiced in with so many people. Yeah. Um, Louis Rose Beef and... Uh, you know, who who really showed up um, at a Christmas party with a brand new pink Cadillac? That that happened. The, the, what you saw in the uh, movie where where Jimmy the Gent loses his mind because Johnny Rose Beef shows up with his brand new wife. He's like, you don't understand, Jimmy. It's my mother in law's name. Yeah, and he really that was his real excuse. <laughs> um, but you know, guys like uh, Louis Rose Beef, the only guy they knew was Jimmy Burke. Uh, yeah. Vinny Asaro knew all the big shots in the Bananos, yeah. a bunch of the big shots in the Gambinos. He was super close to Jimmy the Gent as a contemporary, as like an equal. Yeah. Wasn't a cellmate. Right. Um, so, again, just like you see in the movie, the hit parade starts pretty quickly uh, thereafter. They murdered Stax Edwards, was the first to go exactly one week after the heist. So the heist takes place December 11th, 1978. Uh, Stax Edwards is murdered in December 18th. So one week past that. Then uh, two-gun Tommy Simone is murdered, similar to the way you saw it uh, in, in, um, in the movie. Uh, I believe he was lured under the pretense that uh, he was going to get his button. And he's murdered on December 30th. So about two, two and a half weeks after. And it really didn't have anything to do with Lufanza per se. Um, it had to do with the fact that he had killed those two Gambinos. And then another part of, the, uh, of this story that I think gets lost in the shuffle or not a, a lot of people don't know was there was kind of a love triangle would be the wrong way to say it. Like a qua a love quadrangle between <laughs> Henry Hill, Pauly, uh, Vario and Tommy D Simone. When it came to Karen, um, uh, Henry Hill's wife, who's played by Lorraine Bracco in the movie, you don't see her stepping out on Henry. You just see Henry stepping out on her. Well, in reality, Henry was stepping out on her quite a bit, but, um, she was in a relationship with with Paul with Paulie. Um, in the movie, he's Paulie Cicero. In the in the uh, in real life, he was Paul Vario, and he it was Henry Hill's wife. It was Paul Vario's like side piece. And around this time of the Lufanza heist, Tommy D makes a play for Karen um, wanting to sleep with her. I don't know if he wanted to, to, to grab her as a girlfriend or whatever, but mm -hmm. I think he just wanted to sleep with her one night and she pushed him off and he like beat her up. Mm. Uh, so from my research, this was kind of the impetus that allowed the Gambinos to finally get revenge on Tommy D. Uh, Paulie had been protecting Paulie and Jimmy had been protecting Tommy. Jimmy was very close to Tommy, just like you see in the movie. And Jimmy, I don't think knew that they were going to kill Tommy, just like you see in the movie. Um, but Paulie, because of what happened with Karen, and I don't know what Henry Hill knew or didn't know, but from, I, from people that I, that, that knew the situation told me that uh, when that happened uh, in the, the holiday season uh, of 1978, that uh, Paulie at that point stopped protecting Tommy D and allowed the Gambinos to kill him. But it had to do with him slapping around Karen. Yeah. And that's something like you and I talk about a number of times, like usually these situations are overdetermined. It's not, it's yeah. not one thing. It, one thing might be the catalyst, the final straw, to use a cliche, <clears throat> excuse me, but they even acknowledge that in the film, right? Henry Hill's narration says it goes yeah. and a lot of other, a lot of other and things. a lot of other things. Yeah. Right. So, and, and then 
we're going to hit on this in a minute or two talking about the uh, the um the kind of snowball effect of of someone that that keeps on getting in trouble with various different dangerous people and then they it kind of coalesces to that person's murder so um besides all the stuff that was going on with karen and the stuff that had gone on with uh, billy bats and, and foxy jimmy the gent needs to move this money that they got so he's putting the money uh, he's moving the money all around uh different parts of the country sent some out west sent some down south uh and i know some of the money got sent down to fort uh, fort lauderdale florida and put with a kind of a you know these these crews sometimes have subunits so uh tommy d who was a member of the jimmy the burke or sorry jimmy the gent crew had a couple guys that he was working with that were down in fort lauderdale that were considered lucchese associates and one of the employees at this bar nightclub that these guys owned and, and moved Coke out of and book, uh, book bets and, and gave loans out uh, was a woman named Teresa Ferrara, who was one of Tommy D. Simone's girlfriends. And not only were they suspected of stealing the money that Jimmy, the gent had given them um, to uh, hide and launder, but uh, they believed that she was informing for the FBI. So all those forces were pulling against Tommy D. Simone when he was murdered um, December 30th, 1978. Then we got into January and um, the scene that you, 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 the, the more the Maury, the uh, the wig guy who you see gets killed. I don't know if they, if that's the way they they uh, killed him with a a uh, what was like a screwdriver to the brain in a car. I don't know if that's actually how they did it, but, um, January 17th, 1979. So five weeks, uh, after the heist that had generated from real name, Marty in the, the character, Maury, um, the, the, <laughs> the, the roots that he planted, the seeds that he planted that blossomed into the $6 million, um, treasure trove that they were able to rip off from the Bufanza terminal. They didn't care that it came from him. Uh, I, just like you saw in the movie, he wouldn't shut up about getting his cut. He felt like he deserved a bigger cut than Jimmy wanted to give him. They worried that he was going to, you know, talk to people he shouldn't have talked to if, if they were going to uh, uh, ice him out of it. He did. He saw just like in the movie, you saw a lot of the other guys that were, would be considered, underneath him in the pecking order of that conspiracy uh, flashing money around. And, uh, you know, they, they decided to, to kill him. And so they killed him uh, five weeks later. And it, it's such a macabre thing. I, I hate to have a smile on my face about it, but all I can think of is Carbone warming the car up. What yeah. the fuck you doing? <laughs> Why warming the car up? It's like, what the fuck? Get we're going to we're we're chop him up. We're not going to chop him up here. Yeah, get the fuck out of here. What does he say? We'd be better off letting him drive. <laughs> uh, so he's killed January 6th. Or did, what did I say? Sorry, let me uh, back up for a second. I, I miss. Uh, he was killed January 6th, 1979. So that was about a, less than a month. Um, then January 17th, so uh, about five weeks after um, Richie Eaton is murdered. And we talked about that earlier in the show. Richie Eaton was one of the characters that was. Uh, or one of the people that made up the composite of Frankie Carbone, and they find Richie Eaton in the meat locker uh, on a Brooklyn side street. Jimmy the uh, Jimmy the Gent had given Richie Eaton, Tommy Monteleone, and Teresa Ferrara uh, money to take down to Florida to put into a drug deal and then launder the proceeds through Tommy Monteleone's club uh, bar down in Fort Lauderdale called the Players Club. It was a place where a lot of Lucchese's would hang out whenever they were in Florida. And Monteleone and Richie Eaton were working for Tommy D and, and Jimmy, uh, moving coke, uh, making uh, uh, loans and booking bets out of that bar. And these guys, these two guys and a gal 
um, <laughs> put put their heads together and decided to to steal from the Steelers, mm-hmm. and uh, they all paid the ultimate price. So um, Marty Krugman dies on January six seventy nine. January seventeenth, Richie Eaton is murdered in a Brooklyn warehouse by Jimmy the Gent, and then uh, according to Valente, a sorrow and Valente hang him on the meat lo- hang him in the meat locker. And then February 10th, um, Teresa, uh, Teresa Ferrara disappears. Nobody's ever found her body. Um, she was Tommy D's girlfriend that was working down in Florida and was part of um, stealing what was estimated to be about a quarter million dollars that they took uh, wow. from, from, from Jimmy uh, or from the money that they were supposed to uh, give back to Jimmy and invest into a drug deal they just pocketed. Well, I mean, someone might say, why would you do something that stupid? But I know we're not psychiatrists here, but these people are thieves and it's in their blood. And um, I, I, it's almost like a compulsion. Like, well, I, think I, like they also could- I can't not steal this money in front of me, even if I know that th- this could be really put me in a precarious position. A, a thief is a, is a thief, right? It's in their blood. And I think I think there's two two other things. I think there's a they can do mental gymnastics Mm. And convince themselves, well, there's so much money going around. Yeah, yeah. Nobody's going to be able to keep track of it all. Right. They won't notice. Yeah. And then B, I, I got it ripped off from me. <laughs> yeah. They stole yeah. it from me. When in reality, nobody stole it from them. They just right. pocketed it. Right. Uh, so then the you know, the um, the murder spree continues into the spring. March 8th, 1979. Uh, Louis Roast Beef um, is... Uh, is found with his wife um, in, in, in their pink, pink colored Cadillac uh, murdered Fleetwood, uh, a Fleetwood, a brand new uh, Cadillac Fleetwood. And uh, March 22nd, Tommy Monteleone, uh, one of the guys that stole that money down in Florida, the owner of the players club. Um, he's murdered. And then on May 16th, 1979, not exactly like you saw in the movie, but kind of similar when you saw uh, Joe Buddha and Frenchie uh, together in the trash can. Um, in reality, they were found uh, in like a in a car together, uh, in, in I think a parking structure, um, in a parking in a parking garage. They were side by side, um, Frenchie and, and Frenchie and Joe Buddha. Um, and then uh, June thirteenth, Paulo Lacastri, the uh, Gambino soldier that was on that robbery team, uh, is is thrown in a trash dump. So that's where they kind of played around with the facts. Um, they never shot. They never really had a character based on Lacastri, but Lacastri was the found that, that was the was the victim that was found uh, in, in a trash receptacle. And he was a made guy. I'm not sure. If that seems was, like you'd have to – that could be very problematic. Yeah, I don't know if he was an associate or a main guy, but he was the Gambino point man at the airport in the I same see. way that Vinny uh, Asaro was point man at the airport for, for the Bananos. Because I, it's difficult to imagine Castellano and Dela Croce si- signing off on something like that if he were a made guy. you know, Unless they thought that it could trace back to them. Sure, yeah. Uh, and then the last murder – uh, is like five years later, probably wasn't connected um, to LaFonza, at least not directly. But that was the Angelo Seppi uh, mob figure that I talked about, who was one of the guys that made up the Frankie Carbone composite. Um, night in the summer, uh, summer of 1984, uh, it was alleged that he had uh, ripped off um, uh, higher ranking mob guys in a drug deal. And um, he was murdered along with his girlfriend uh, in his bed, I believe. So, you know, those were 12, and I would call them, you know, either the Goodfellas hits or the Lufanza Terminal heist hits. Uh, Vinny Asaro was tied to some of the cleanup, some of the disposal. Uh, I don't believe he was tied to any of the actual homicides. He did beat a homicide case, though, in that same Lufanza trial. In, in 2015, he was a, he was charged with a cold case murder from 1969 where him and Jimmy Burke allegedly 
strangled a, a Lucchese associate named Paulie Katz to death with a dog collar. Mm. Uh, they believed that he was snitching and he was somebody that worked in um, stolen uh, in the hijacking racket and was uh, owned property where they they stored stolen goods. So so I haven't read Wise Guy in a long time. I, I haven't read Stefano's book in a long time. So Henry Hill becomes a snitch. He ends up testifying against Vario and Burke. I don't remember. Why doesn't he implicate Asaro in, in the case? I don't remember. Sometimes you can have a, a situation, maybe more than sometimes, where a guy flips, he debriefs, he names, let's say, 10 people in a conspiracy, and the prosecutors only feel comfortable charging six. Sure. Um, so you could be named yeah, and and the finger pointed at you and the feds believing that you were involved in it, but somehow you skate. Yeah. I, I, that's just my my gut. What Another kind of irony that I, I think is interesting to to pull from from this was that Jimmy the Gent was not convicted of the robbery. Jimmy the Gent wasn't convicted of any murders. Uh, Jimmy the Gent went to prison because Henry Hill inadvertently told the feds about a point shaving scandal that right. they weren't even looking at. Right. And, and that Henry Hill in his warped criminal mind didn't think it was a crime <laughs> or at least that's what he said. Yeah. Um, I thought it was just kind of being smart or something that you could get a basketball player on your payroll and get them manip to manipulate point spreads. Um, and they reference it in the movie. Um, one time if you don't know if you're not looking for it you wouldn't get it i think right before the maury character is murdered he says did we tell you about the points we were shaving up in boston and i think right before right after he says that they stick the screwdriver in the back yeah didn't michael francis on our show tell us he he was involved in some of that bc yeah stuff with henry hill we asked him if he remembered henry hill and he i think he mentioned that yeah so we can go back and watch that video there's a good 30 for 30 uh for you know those those espn uh, documentaries. I'm sure you can get them on streaming platforms that, that dives into that, uh, that point shaving scandal from, it was from the 78, 79 season. So it was right when this was all happening. Um, when Lufanza was going on, they were actively shaving points. I believe in that, that 78, 79 season, or it might've been the 77, 78 season, but it was that same time period. Uh, and they allegedly got two or three really standout, Boston College basketball players, three starters, I believe, two captains, um, and they manipulated a lot of uh, point spreads that year. And it is one of those examples where they overcharged Burke and Vario because, and you're, I, I get it, you're not supposed to do this rule of law; it's problematic. But isn't some one of these examples where they overcharged them really for other things that they yes. didn't, that they didn't yes. get? Yes. Okay. Yes. It was like someone said to me. Um, uh, this is going down a rabbit hole here, but I was doing a um, a, a Facebook Live uh, on the Philly mob page, and they asked me about Georgie Cowboy Martirano. How did he get 32 years just for a marijuana case? I said, the prosecutors and the judge sentencing him, that was a lot deeper yeah. than the fact that he got uh, caught selling marijuana. They wanted to jam him for a murder they thought he committed and stuff that his father had did. Yeah. Um, it really, it was a lot. So yes. Yeah, so I, I, Jimmy, the gent went away longer than he probably would have gone away on a normal point basketball shaving. point shaving case. He yeah. died, in, died in prison and, and both him and Paulie both died in prison. Yeah. And it's interesting too, with the sorrow that his stature really gets even bigger after all the dust settles because he doesn't go to prison He's still alive. He's a captain. And and he's he already has the pedigree, right? And he's already a serious guy, well respected, well liked guy. But now his 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 legend is just, you know, the mythology where where like, you know, he's it, the one who makes it out and and is still on the streets. But isn't it interesting? I mean, unless you were a unless you were a real uh, uh Nick Pelleggi nerd or Lufanza nerd. I, I didn't know that Vinny Asaro played any role in this until he was charged in 2014. I knew who Vinny Asaro was. So it's yeah. kind of interesting how, like, those who knew, knew, and it definitely benefited Vinny in his career. But he also 
benefited from the general public not knowing. There was no like clamoring for for uh, justice uh, and accountability in terms of him and Lufanza the way there was there was for you know the 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 other uh, co conspirators. And I remember his name reading Wise Guy, but I read that so long ago that I didn't fully appreciate who he was or the connections to Castellamari because I really had not deep dived. I wasn't deep diving that case study yet. So to your point, I remember reading it in the paperback, but it just didn't like kind of resonate with me until later on. And then it was like, oh, yeah, I'm all right now. I'm now I'm researching this guy. He's a big deal. And then it's like, yeah, and he was also very important player in the Lufthansa heist. Right. And it was like, oh, shit, you know, like you're putting it all together. Well, again, if you're not a nerd, if you're not someone I I use that term because I'm a nerd. I mean, I'm sure, not yeah. using that derogatory. Yeah, if you're not course. somebody that like really deep dives this stuff and studies this, you think of the the movie Goodfellas and Lufthansa heist. You think of the Lucchese's. You don't yeah. think of the yeah. Bananos or the Gambinos. Yeah. And if, if I can add a few other things kind of tie it back to this Sicily stuff. So by the eighties, Asaro's a captain. He's a big deal. He, he survives all of this, doesn't go to prison. And I'm, I'm getting mixed Intel on um, how much interaction was between him and the zips because he's got the pedigree going back to Castellamari. And I've heard from a source that he really didn't give a shit about the zips. And for example, his cousin, Mariano Asaro, they call him Mariano Le Americano because he travels to New York so often. He's a dentist, by the way. I don't know if people know this. It's a lot more common in Sicily for like professionals to be made made guys. You hardly ever <laughs> see that in the yeah, here, States. right? Um, so he traveled to New York a lot. And apparently, uh, you know, I was hearing that Vinny didn't interact with him very much, even though he was, uh, they were cousins. And Mariano Asaro is a heavyweight in the Borgata and Castellamari. But now I'm, I'm uncovering some other stuff that suggests maybe his relationship with the Zips was more complicated. For example, um, at some point in the early 80s, we don't know the year, but there's a sit down with Rostelli, who's the boss of the Bananos. And on the other side of the sit down, it's Asaro with Baldo Amato and Cesare Bonventre. And at one point during the sit down, Asaro, Bonventre, and Amato start conversing with each other in Sicilian. And uh, Rostelli views this as like an affront, right? He, he He's really offended and basically takes it as a fuck you because he doesn't understand Sicilian. And um, I think that's an interesting little nugget of information about, first of all, suggesting Asaro may have had closer relations to his Sicilian uh, Amici from Castellamare but also the politics in terms of what guys like that, how they viewed Rusty. And we had the episode with Messino a few weeks ago with Frank Fiordolino, and he says that Bonventre and some of those guys, some of those zips didn't have a lot of respect for for Rusty, and which is why Bonventre ends up getting killed, that, right. you know, go down that rabbit hole. Um, so it may be more complicated, th- this relationship, and we also know that, during the eighties, Asaro was visiting Bonventre's social club in Bensonhurst um, frequently. So at least maybe, maybe things had changed in the nineties and two thousands as he was getting older, maybe he, those ties became less strong, but there's some Intel here that suggests he had some relationship with the zips, at least in the, in the seventies well, and eighties. I, I think I, I'm, and I don't want to claim to be an expert on the banana zips, uh, or um, on the, the the granular machinations um, of some of the, the political wins of, of the 70s. But I do believe that Asaro got his promotion to Capo in the wake of Galante's assassination. So the Zips were on the side of the, of the coup. Yes. So if you want, if you want to do the math in your head or, you know, play the connect the dots, you would think that Messino and, and Rustelli and the zips were, were the decision makers at that point. 
And when we saw it in Donnie, we keep on quoting movies. Uh, in Donnie Brasco, he said, uh, you know, uh, Phil, uh, Rusty's going to run the whole thing from the can. Sonny yeah. Red's got man. Or Sonny Red's got Little Italy. I got Brooklyn. Yeah. Um, and, so in that in that distribution of power, I believe that's when Asaro got the Queens crew. Yeah, and also according to Frank, who we had on a few weeks ago, he he's arguing that Messino was not as pivotal in the three captains hit as traditionally thought. That basically R- Rastelli wanted to, but he couldn't have pulled that off without the zips. To your point about at least at that point there was somewhat of an alliance Mm -hmm. Uh, as as fragile as that was there was some type of alliance at least to take out indelicato and the other two captains but we know not long after that it 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 falls apart and and bon ventre ends up getting killed 79 is the assassination 81 is the uh three capos hits and then 80 spring of 84 or early summer of 84 was when they killed cesare and we also know that there's some evidence later on that Asaro is one of the high-ranking Bonanos who is having sit-downs with other high-ranking Bonanos like Grimaldi to to discuss the the assassination of Sal Montagna, who's another Custom Rays guy who was the acting the ba- Bonano boss at one point. Bambino, the, ba- the Bambino boss. Yeah, the baby. He was only 30, was only 35 <laughs> years old, and he was yeah, acting boss guy. acting boss of the, uh, of the Bonano clan for a couple of years before he gets deported. To Montreal gets involved in the war up there, and it, that costs him costs him his life. Yeah, and 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 Nassaro says Sal Montagna was one of the bosses in this brigada, so um, he he was being updated on that situation. And then there's and then the other great um, example where when they when they're talking about the murder of uh, Nicolo um, or um, one of the Rizzutos, and um, I can't remember if it was Nicolo or if it was one of the sons. I can't remember. Someone could fact check me. But they said, um, what's going on in Montreal? And he says, I don't even know what the fuck's going on in Howard Beach, right. <laughs> let alone <laughs> let alone you want me to explain what the fuck's going on in Montreal. Yeah. Um, so he was he had the he was just a very popular guy. He had these great quips like that. And there's the other um uh came out in the testimonials was he was upset about that one Bonanno guy, younger Bonanno guy who had an Instagram account. Yeah. And they're talking about back and forth wh- what he posted. Was it incriminating? And Asaro says, forget all that. What right. the fuck is he doing on Instagram? Period. I don't care if it's incriminating or not. It's a bad look. <laughs> right. He shouldn't be on Instagram yeah. in the first place. Right. So he, he was just a real like, um, you know, a, a living legend in his, uh, you know, in his time. Well, I, I enjoyed this episode. Uh, R.I.P. to Vinny Asaro. Um, we're going to end. Uh, I'm going to kick it to Jimmy for a couple minutes. We got some show news um, that Jimmy wants to address. And, um, you know, let's let's hear it, Jim. Yeah, so this is with uh, um, mixed feelings that I, I make this announcement. Um, I've had a great time, uh, five years working on this podcast with Scott, who's one of my best friends. I consider him family. And uh, we've had a lot of fun and getting to know Benny, who's just a, you know, a great guy and a professional. Um, but uh, I've mentioned before, people I think know, at least some audience members know that I'm a faculty member at the university. And sometimes it's not easy for me to balance working on the podcast full time and taking care of my university responsibilities. Because there's a lot of work that goes into this. I don't know if audience members, you know, not to, to bore you to death, but there's a lot of grunt work that goes into what, you know, behind the scenes that the three of us do with scheduling and booking guests and editing and uploading things and managing social media. And um, it's it's becoming, it's gotten to the point where it's not sustainable for me. I, ha- I have um, a lot of obligations at the university that were just dumped in my lap and I don't want to bore people with the details, but I have to take a uh, sabbatical from the podcast. I'm not sure when I'll be able to return. I will be involved in some behind the scenes uh, things, the things that we're talking about. I I will still help with some of the production aspects of it. So I'm not disappearing, uh, but I can no longer commit to a weekly, you know, episode. There may be some special appearances where I can jump on now and then, but I need to get, take care of this work at the university, get that out of the way Hopefully, uh, you know, I'll be able to return 
a full time at some point. But in the meantime, you're good hand. You're in good hands. Scott is is a rock star, uh, and Benny's is is really professional and excellent at what he does. So I know you you will be in in good hands. I'm confident that the podcast will continue to prosper, and uh, I may look different and sound different in in some ways as as we smooth all of this out. But I just wanted to thank everyone. It's been very humbling. Uh, we have almost three million audio downloads, over a million views on YouTube. It's very humbling. It's it's been a lot of fun. I appreciate everyone's support and the kind words. And um, you know, I'll be around, but I'm doing some other some other things for a while. So thank you, Scott. Thank you, Benny, and thank you to the audience. Well, you know, I can't thank Jimmy enough. I mean, he he really is the reason this podcast exists. Um, it, you know, it, it's his baby, and then he kind of gave me half of the baby and then it became our baby um and i i I wouldn't be here if it wasn't you know jimmy was the genesis of all this um and i like like he said he he's not just my podcasting partner he's he's probably my best friend and someone i consider a family so i mean we're we're still gonna you know be communicating and in contact and seeing each other Uh, he's still gonna have jimmy's still gonna have a lot of uh, input um be a uh, kind of like a consul, like a, he's going to be like the Tony Accardo uh, yeah. uh, of, of, of the of the Chicago outfit in his later days, where he's kind of heard but not necessarily seen. Um, but I'm hoping that this is uh, is this is sh- a sh- shorter term than longer term. I mean, only time will tell. Uh, Jimmy can come back at a full time basis anytime he wants, uh, but we'll we'll be holding the fort down. We're still going to be you know ramping up content. Uh, I'm going to be trying to give you more quick hitters uh the shorter episodes to fill out the week and then still give you the one long form episode a week probably going to be a little bit more interview based um without a, a co-host for these kind of episodes where we can go back and forth so uh i'm thinking that most of the um stuff like this where we're talking and dissecting and analyzing um will, will be in the quick hitters and then the uh, the, the 60 to 90 minute pod that we put out every week will just be really in-depth interviews with the type of people that uh, you guys want. And, and I'm doing my best to deliver, you know, fresh, fresh subjects and fresh guests, not people that you've seen. And I'll do respect to all the other great uh, content platforms there are, but I, I kind of want to be the guy that's giving you the first look at somebody before they make their way through the uh you know the circuit if you will so uh, i got a couple people lined up that i think you're going to be really excited about um between now and the end of the year guys that have never done interviews before some law enforcement some actual wise guys or ex wise guys so you know keep an eye out for that and i just i can't thank jimmy enough i love you man and uh, i'll I'll really miss us chopping it up together uh hopefully we can do it again together like i said sooner than later but you know this is uh this is just life and you got to roll with the punches and all i can do is tip my hat to uh the doctor and tell him (laughs) how much how much i love him and how much i'll miss him and how integral he was to this entire brand that that we're still going to be building and um hopefully 10 years from now we can sit sit back with a with a, a some some drinks and be doing the podcast with (laughs) <laughs> a lot more bells and whistles and talk. Oh, I remember that time 10 years ago where you had to take a, a year <laughs> off or you know, six yeah. months off. But yeah, that would, that would be great. Well, thanks again. Thanks for the kind words. And uh, we'll be back or at least Scott and Betty will be back next week. So uh, I'm Jimmy Bucciolato. And I'm Scott Bernstein. OG pod out. Mm-hmm.